unifying factor. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about um, the possibility. You, talk, you talked about the possibility of an America as it <laughs> should be and could be, and how there's a possibility that's woven into your artistry. Tell me about what that what that is. So right now, my work, so com I do what I call community-based public art. So a lot of your listeners will know about murals, and murals have a long history. Some of it's political, some of it is fun, some of it's controversial, you know. Uh, some of it's huge, large scale, some of it's small scale, some of it's guerrilla art where you put it on a building and make a statement, and especially those in the New York area. Or, you know, there's cities like New York, LA, Philadelphia that have big programs with this. Baltimore has a lot of cool artists as well. We do a lot of interesting work. Community-based public art for me is not taking it, say, I do a large painting of the Alvin Ailey Dance Company. And then you come to me and say, hey, Jay, I love this painting. I want to enlarge that and put it on a giant building that's five or six stories high, which I could do. I said, you know, I already did the work. My, what I'm interested in is the voice of the community being in the work. So I have developed over the last 20 years a process, which is the design workshop, based on whatever issues, and they could, be, excuse me, they could be anything from death, violence, addiction, homelessness, dementia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Wow. It, wow. You know, I've worked on all these issues. And it's very intense, you know, recovery from addiction, and uh, as well as celebration. And the workshop, which is divided into three parts, encourages participants to help create. So I work with two-year-olds to 102. I've worked with groups of 10 to 1,000. I've done works that are small to 4,000 square feet to even painting the trunks of trees to honor hundreds of people in recovery, which still has a stigma, you know, of all backgrounds. And so in the workshop, I try to empower them to say, you know, art is not about how well you can paint in my workshops, but how well you can think, right? And that's, you can- So, okay, so you're like, uh, tease this out for us. So you're going into communities, are they inviting you? Are you pitching to them? How this question, it could be both ways. Sometimes like the school that I'm at now that you saw a, a little TV spot on me, it's called Callaway yeah. Elementary School in Northwest Baltimore City. So like many urban areas around the country, enormous challenges. Some based on systemic racism, but also based on what I would call systemic, uh, economic disasters, right? You know, these kind of things that it's not only about race or religion, it's also about where the hell you sit on that economic chain, right? You know? Yeah, and that's all interwoven, as you know. Right. Yep, yep, yep. And so I, I guess my first time I did that as a volunteer, that's where I should start. I was, had a good year and I thought I need to give back because my parents taught me well, right? You know, and I had to do that. And there was some place advertising to do a mural. I'd never done a mural. Now, when I was 19, I had done very large backdrops in the theater. Like, think New York City for West Side Story or London for Oliver. Large, hanging. Yeah, giant stuff. You know, it was great, man. I, I, so those are all long stories. Very cool. We probably won't have time today, but I will come back if you would like. I would love that. I would love that. <laughs> And uh, I am for hire, everybody. Okay, I do make a living. So I'm going to drop that link right down here. <laughs> so, all right. That's so, it. So anyway, uh, the, the first time I did this and volunteered in what we would now call politely a challenged community. Hmm. It means a very impoverished community. Baltimore certainly has some of the poorest communities in America. Many of your, uh, your listeners and viewers will remember Freddie Gray from not that long, like, oh, like three years ago. It's hard to believe. You know, and I worked in many challenged communities where it was like Nazi Germany, where, you know, police threw people against the wall, particularly black males, 18 to 40 something. Yeah. No calls for, you know, just all the time. It was very depressing. Um, it's a very complex relationship because, of course, police are wanted to help protect in a community. And not every police person is bad, but there yeah. was enough corruption that, so, uh, for example, we, we heard for many years that. Guns were planted in the black community. Everybody said, you're full of shit, you're full of shit. So finally, there's been a whole bunch of cops just arrested here for that, for illegal gun things. Uh, uh, yeah, of course. I'm surprised. It's like that line at Casablanca when he says, gambling going on here. I'm shot. I'm shot. Right, right. We, we so, know these things. So I felt compelled to take my talents and try to make a difference. So I found, you know, I, I called an organization, Neighborhood Design Center, which is 
a large nonprofit here that works in many communities and said, give me a school, let's do it. And I saw an ad where they were looking for somebody and I did that, I painted like four sides of a building, but I saw the impact it had on the kids that I was working with, particularly a couple boys who no matter how early I got there, they got there before me. If I got there at 7 a.m., they got to paint the mural. They got there at 6.45. If I got there at 6. These are young black kids in the community. Middle school. This was a middle school. And that was the first time that I actually was on the front lines of what we call front lines of human rights, where I would see these kids live in a boarded up block. They were the only two houses in the middle. You know, we pass by these if we don't live there, right? Right, right. I actually worked there. I'll give you a quick story. Like the first time I worked there, I went to the school. It's a summer school. And when I came, it was the first school in Baltimore. I've seen it in New York. This was like late 90s, where I walked into school. There was a big metal detector, and there was a policeman, and the principal, who was not such a nice person, was sitting in the front like this. I go into my classroom, and I come out. She says, excuse me, sir. I said, yes. She says, was there something wrong? I said, what do you mean? She says, it was very quiet in there. I said, what? <laughs> it turns out the way they would discipline is screaming at the children. Right. Like right. this verbal aggression violence. Or aggression. Yes. Oh yes. God. And when we were working on the wall, it was a hot summer. And thank God my brother-in-law, Josh, who's now principal at a private middle school. But at the time, he was a science teacher and basketball. I mean, sorry. He was a language teacher, Spanish, and basketball coach of a private middle school. I said, can you help me with this? Because I never really worked with kids. And mm -hmm. so he helped me get through the first project many, many years ago. So I remember we're on this wall painting based on their designs, the voice of the community in the work. It's like a folk style, yeah. which is also based on my studio work. Think of like a combo of Romare Beard and the American artist and Henri Matisse, the French artist. He's cut out collages where I can move my own pieces of paint around based on my watercolors that I do at all performances, landscapes. I'm interested in movement and energy. Can you tell I'm interested in movement and energy? <laughs> I'm here for it, I'm here for it. Right. Yeah. So now I'm on this wall. It's a hot fucking summer day in Baltimore. It's like 98 degrees, high humidity. The field house that we did this on with all these kids helping me paint based on their designs. I'm marking it out. I have a crew. I'm volunteering. They're all there. The teachers are there very wary with the kids are going to do something. There's a playground there. And I say, hey, why don't you? She says, Mr. J, can we take a break? I said, yeah, you're doing great. As soon as they started off the wall, one of the teachers said, what are you doing? And they said, well, Mr. J says, I don't care what Mr. J said. Mr. J is with the wall, but I own you all. Get back on that wall. What? But it, look, it was so loud and so, it was like someone shot us. We went like this. <laughs> like, yeah, hands up. And that's when I started, that was my introduction to the great dysfunction that goes on with how our students were treated and which yeah. opened the door to see this. And when I saw these young boys who came every day and how they wanted this so badly, I think my dad and I took them to a Ravens football game. It was the first one I was ever at, but we took them. And when that project was done, it was very powerful because during a little girl, 13 year old, hot summer night, went to get ice at a bar, was killed by a stray drug bullet. We dedicated to her. Her parents who were crushed or thankful we did something. This was all my introduction. You know, we all know this intellectually. For those of you watching who grew up with this, understand it, of course, viscerally. This is your life. I gave you my background because I was blessed to have a supportive, nonviolent, healthy, you know, kind of background in a right. middle class home where love was the cement of everything. Love being respect and this is home and it's safe, right? And it's clear that you feel a responsibility to... Right change the the movement and energy of spaces because you've been blessed to have a that's different right and also but being aware doing after doing that first project think you know there's a line from Karl Marx I don't love Karl Marx but this idea that once your consciousness is raised what will you as a human being do and we already have a challenge as a species anyway right Woo. say that one more time say that one more time for once your consciousness is raised this was seeing the situation in these communities in Baltimore. Yeah. How, what are you going to do? And as, a, as taught through my progressive Judaism, as a progressive Americanism, right? And just as, because of my parents and my siblings and family and friends, we were taught you have to do something. No matter how bad off you are, there's always things even worse off. But it's not just that it's worse off, that you can actually make a difference. 
And that idea of hope mm -hmm. is being crushed by the president of revenge, you know, because of his issues, you know. And it's, we didn't realize, I mean, we knew who knew him in New York. He'd never changed. The problem is, and those who support him politically, is that it has broken this hope, idea of hope. When you ask me what America should be and could be, that's what I look to. I do not, you know, get rid of the horrible racial issues we've had with slavery and, and the Trail of Tears and all the Native American and people who are brown who are coming in from all these countries and the terrible things that happened to Asian Americans. I mean, really, anybody kind of wasn't white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, economically placed, right? When you yeah. hear about the Irish immigrants in the 1840s through Civil War, the horrible things said about them, you know, this is the part of America that we have to fix. And yeah. We haven't well, apologized for any of this, right? So, yeah, this just breaks. Okay, so now this just starts. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm jumping away. But this oh, actually it, informs my work. I want you yes, to know. Yes, and, and think and if you're going to get back to how this informs your work, I just now have to like dovetail for a second okay, because this is the show. Um, how, oh, how do I even ask this question? There is a, um, in a lot of social activism work, which I'm involved in and you're involved in, you've heard of the term of calling, not only calling out, but calling in. Yeah, I like that. And, and so like, how have you influenced, we know that black and brown people are disenfranchised and pushed to the outskirts and there's you know, economic inequalities and all kinds of supremacist uh, behaviors. How are you working in, in the Jewish spaces and with the, I don't you know, uh, Tenehisi Coates would say, those who believe themselves white. How are you working in those spaces to call them into your awesome way of thinking? Well, that's a great, it's a great question. You know, it's like sometimes projects are specific, like the ones at school in a challenged community. And we learn over time that if the principle is good, then the project will be a success. Okay. Right. If you have support at the top, and there are some amazing teachers and principals in Baltimore City, my partners in my group, which is called Rebuilding Through Art Project over the years, like Miss Gloria, who I've worked with for 20 years. I mean, her son was choked to death by the police and, you know, right around the corner from where Freddie Gray lived, in these wow. communities. So when I first started this, and I started inviting friends in other communities to come down and look at first, but well, we don't go there, man. It's like, even though it's 10 minutes from downtown Baltimore, right? Yeah. It's like being in the village in New York. Yeah, it's like being in the village in New York, and I'm not going to go to 34th Street. I, exactly. I, right? I know it's hard for New Yorkers to imagine that, but in many cities, there are these ghettoized areas, and because of Baltimore's history of terrible systemic racism and economics and housing and da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da, we pretend it doesn't exist, but the results of it are still with us. Right. So anyway, I'm getting off again. Sorry, I'm sorry. So I always talk about it. I said, you need to see the other. I mean, I said, you know, if they're Jewish, I say, and, and look, it's only a, a smaller percentage of Jews, thank God, who don't want to do anything with this. Most people want to make a difference. And before um, the riots in 68, the bonds between Jewish civil rights and African-American civil rights were very powerful. And many rows have broken it up over that, but I still believe that it's possible, and I bring people into my projects. They're there at the workshops. They're seeing it firsthand, and when they see it firsthand, everything changes, because it's not like two minutes. My workshops last about two hours. You have to do about writing about the theme, and then yeah. you paint it, which freaks out almost every adult, and that's why I said, okay, it's not about how well you can paint. It's how well you can perfectionism thing they want they want to get scared. i think it's mostly fears probably because like and i see with singing and art if someone told you know you hear someone they said oh that sounds good so, uh oh i can't sing i said well who do i just hear sing they said oh my grandma or somebody told me i suck at singing it's the same with art most people have been told by someone they trust that you suck at this so i have to transcend all that stuff right i now have a partner who's an expert in social economic uh, social emotional learning SEL, and they're now kids in my class. You know, this is an elementary school that I am not equipped to help them with their issues, and the schools don't have enough help. But without her, some of these kids who've now transcended their behavioral issues or mental health issues are succeeding in my class because I have someone like her. So I'm always learning. Yeah, because so anyway, to answer the question, you people, a partnership. they work together. Okay. Yeah.
I will give you a really great example. Um, several years ago, before Freddie Gray happened, okay, there was an incident in an area of northwest Baltimore called Upper Park Heights. They have three main communities live there. It's mostly middle class, not a poor community like our, what we traditionally think of as really challenged. But the challenge was the three communities. There was Orthodox Jewish American, African American, and Hispanic American, as we will say on the East Coast, right? They yeah. all lived together, but they were all wary of each other. They all probably were afraid of each other. They probably, some of them hated each other. And definitely they never talked to each other, the other. And an incident happened where the Jewish community have a group called Shomrim, which is Hebrew for like, um, I guess like private police, something like that, guards. Oh, yes. They were hired, you know, tool around to provide quote unquote safety. And one day... Someone called about something. They saw a young black student in high school. They thought he was a guy, and they beat him up. Turned out, of course, it was the wrong guy. This is what happens when you have private policing. You know, regular policing is already tough for those who yeah. are right? it's like, you know, yeah, give everybody a gun. That's what they if they all had a gun, they would have shot the kid. Right. He was a scholar, and he was a great kid. And I thought, oh, my gosh. This is going to be 1968. They're going to burn Baltimore down. You know, we still haven't recovered from that 50 years later. No one right. Really that that. Rodney King out west. Oh, yeah. I remember I was in L.A. at the time for that. It was horrible. You just don't recover from these things, partly because we haven't apologized for the bottom, you know, the underneath of this. Anyway, I thought it was going to break out. But because the community was so strong between the different Jewish groups and the churches and the community, they talked it out, the apologies were there, and nothing, you know, it was, it, they moved to a new level of understanding. And part of that was they hired me through the Jewish Community Center, which is the oldest in America. They mm -hmm. said, and I've been asking for this, to do a project with all the community doing one of my mural projects because the workshop process alone brings everybody together. And you have to confront the other. You got to sit there. It's like imagine you have everybody... We're going to bring them all as actors to improv on a play. And you all got to take roles. And you got to sort of do like Elizabeth Suedo's type thing where it's going to be based on your background, right? And you, right. Andre, are going to tell about you. And I'm going to tell you about me. And then somehow we're going to come together. And really, there actually is a kumbaya moment because what happens is you realize the humanity in each everyone. So I had a poet work on that. We did this like once a month. We first did it with all the families. And the theme was about, you know, who we are. The theme actually became look, period, again, period, understand, quote, the other. Okay. Wow. We're middle school boys, all right? So a lot of stuff going on. You know, yeah. that ultra-Orthodox Jews with the payas and the kippah and all that, the black kids and the, you know, Hispanic kids, and they're all like, whoa, they were all at different tables at first. But little by little, they came together. We even invited police to be on this, families there. The grant people, they got so moved, the people gave us money, they said, well, you don't have to do the mural. I said, we're going to do the mural. Okay, let's, let's do this. They said, like, don't even worry about the mural. Just like, this is, this is, this the is. The workshop process itself is so powerful and emotional. By the time, by the time they get to doing the final collage, they do, I'll, I'll say it again, because I talk quickly, I'm sorry. They first discuss the idea. Yeah. Our theme is, you know, it could say, how do you make a difference somewhere? And then we have to make it specific. Then they paint from those ideas, because most people who don't paint are scared to death about what to paint. So over the years, paint large scale or just painting on a yeah, like this paint, like on a Xerox sheet. I use all the cheapest low end stuff, you know, using yeah. paint and all. That. It's just again, it's about not how well you paint, but how well you think. I want to see what their personal imagery is. Then they have to come together as a team and cut it all up. And usually, the ones who complain the most about, well, Mr. J, I'm not an artist, saying, "What do you mean? I got to cut my work up?" I said, "Yes, <laughs> my workshop is the only place." Well, you will never take anything home. It goes back to the community. So then they work and create collages, cutouts, like my studio work. Okay. And then they also have to write a story because there might be some image. I don't know what the hell it is, but it could be extremely profound. Remind me to tell you about that in a minute. I'll give you an example. So mm -hmm. we have everybody sitting in it. And the day that the poets said to me, uh, we had the workshop. The pro work, I, have a, a, I usually do a lot of this through writing. I used to try different methods, but over the years, writing is the best way to have people express ideas that then could be painted. Um, she came up with the idea. She said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have everybody 
write down the worst stereotypes they know about their own people. And then we're going to share. <laughs> it's fantastic. So you got the Jewish kids, they talk about the nose and the money. And the black kids talk about, you know, the violence. And they're, they're lazy. And the Latino kids talk about, you know, we're all illegal. And, all. and but what happened, of course, they all started laughing because it's what they were talking about, their own group. And that was the time combined with the art where they were, after that, they all mixed together. And it never Did they realize that, like, that everyone was suffering through a self thought right. process and like, like, and it's absurd. Right. And These stereotypes right. have been put onto us by others. And we all have that been put on by the bad others, so to speak. Right. Right. And by the, t and then they started encouraging the other in their work. Sometimes the teachers were there. When we finally did this, we, we were supposed to put on this giant police academy that was the gateway to the community. It was going to be huge, like about 3,000 square feet. The police begged me. They said to me, how can we get to know the community? I said, put the mirror on your wall. You'll, when you paint together and eat together, everything changes. You know, you have a dialogue. It's not like, hey, like you and I in 10 minutes, how well do we get to know each other? Like, I feel like if I saw you on the street, Andre, I feel like we're family now, okay? Uh, there would be a giant hug. Like, right, a hug. Oh, yeah. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Man, oh, man. Yeah, but here's what happened. The police said, there's no way you will ever put a mural in a police building. I said, guys, just do it once. And they never did. And it took me five years to find a fucking place to put this mural, and I couldn't put it anywhere. So I had to divide it up at the two schools and the Jewish yeah. community center. And so the they, final part, wait, the final they part. They were not willing to engage in that way with the community? They came to the workshop, but we couldn't put it on their wall. And I had the board, there's 54 people on the board of the Jewish Community Center. They wrote to the mayor, all 54 of them. We had meetings with the head of the police. We did everything we could. And still, the police, who wanted to get to the community sincerely, right. it just was out of their way of living. It was crazy. To, but we eventually put it up. Actions. <laughs> Words versus actions. Right. The best part of all this story, to end with what you asked me originally about how do those who can, don't understand these communities and each yeah. of our sufferings or how should we be functioning in America. So they were at the workshops. That changed stuff immediately between all the communities. And then this is over time. It's not overnight. I'm not like, you know, but they say, oh, well, we'll let Jay bring the three communities together. I said, thank you. Okay. Right. Well, we know you marched with Martin Luther King. We know when you were in state government as the film commissioner, you were once asked to replace Thurgood Marshall on a speech because he was sick. I said, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's what? To qualify me to do this. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but at the end, five years later, when the boys in middle school were now men going into college, and they all talk like this. I, they recognized me. I couldn't recognize it. We had a big press opening for the unveiling of all this. And one of the young men from the African-American community was very eloquent. And he said, he said, I have to tell you, without these workshops, we would have never, ever talked to our neighbor who was different from us. And that changed my life. And I made him speak. Most of them were Jewish. Always, but no, I was Jewish and black, I would say. The crowd that was there. And he, very, he was so eloquent. And he told, I said, what are you going to major? He said, philosophy. I said, okay, this is great. None of these people here think a black kid getting up there is going to major in philosophy. So I said to him, I said, I want you to tell everybody, because I, I want you to watch their reactions. It was fucking great, man. So I said, so, uh, so John, I said, so what are you going to do in college? He says, I'm going to be a philosophy major. And there was like dead silence. Yeah. But then they embraced this young man. And that's what I do. We call it the wrap effect, that you go through this workshop because it's rebuilding through art project. To yeah, okay. You have an artist make up an acronym. <laughs> I, look, I love a good acronym. Right, well, that's what we got. And then we got stuck with it. So we had to always use it. I've done over 60 of these kinds of projects around the country, you know, Oakland and San Francisco and Baltimore, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And um, it always works the same. There is some transformation. And finally, along these ideas, there's a Jewish quote that says, if you save one life, it says, if you save the entire world. And what that means, of course, is not only for the future, your lineage way into the future, Andre, however that is, however yeah. you touch, but also where you came from, from your first mothers and fathers. And so to my partner's chagrin in the past, they don't bother me anymore. I would say I'm not worried about capacity. Capacity in grant speak means how many people actually work on the project. Right. If someone gives you 5,000, if someone gives you 50,000, whatever it is, 
oh, I need lots of people. I said, no, we want to really touch people. We want to change their lives. We want them to know against all odds, whether it's a glass ceiling or a glass skyscraper ceiling, you right. stop the shot and you cannot let anybody tell you different because there still is the possibility here. It's not idealistic bullshit. We have seen the changes in individuals from these little children to adults. I've had adults weeping at the places, whether they were Native Americans who are dementia caregivers in Tucson, Arizona, or whether they're parents dealing with the death of someone's father in West Baltimore. Through the workshop, my first partner, Ms. Ann, who was 80, talked about the horrible racism she went through during World War II building B-52 bombers to help save our troops because she was a black woman. But she was also a ballet dancer, a basketball player. She got finally was in a museum here in Baltimore, the Visionary Museum, which is one of my favorite museums, and they showed her work. She became an artist at 80, and she said, I thank you, Mr. J, because she painted a folk pieta. Pieta is like the mother with the dead son. We know most in Christianity with Mary and the dead Christ, right? I've never heard, say that word again, pieta. Pieta, spelled P-I-E-T-A. I don't know if it's Latin or Italian. If you know the work of the Italian artist, sculptor, architect, Michelangelo, yeah. He has a very famous one with Mary, with Jesus in her arms, the dead Christ figure in her arm, you know, carved out of marble. I don't know how the hell he did it. <laughs> you know, it's unbelievable. But that image, so she had a folk one like that. There was the, the black mom with her dead son. And she did it in one of our workshops. And I she said, did it at 80? Yeah. And I said, Miss Ann, um, I, I took me two days. This was one of my first workshops I ever did in the community. We were doing a big mural, and I asked her afterwards. I said, uh, I waited two days. I said, I couldn't, of course, stop thinking of it because I said, who is that? And of course, she said, that's me. And that's my son, Brad, who was murdered for his coat, right? For his coat. So, yeah. And I asked her a couple of days. I said, you know, Miss Ann, I said, most of my work is about who we are at our best, but I need to put this in the mural because uh, I, I was trying to show the community who we could be kind of thing. And she said, Mr. J, I would be honored if you used that. She says, because of you, I haven't painted in 50 years. And your workshop empowered me to talk about things that I've kept here. And so what I found by chance, because I have a good crew, good artists who work with me from all backgrounds, from 80-year-olds to, to, you know, 15-year-olds, mm -hmm. from my assistants from all backgrounds, I have to say mostly women, but I also had a lot of men work with me as well. Um, somehow we touch them. We, we use what probably touched you with that is, which came through is, that we get to know the participants, even if it's for a day, and it's safe there. So if we're talking about recovery, and I have 110 people doing the workshop with me, their families are there, right. supported like they've never been. Um, if it's about reading on the brain, which we're doing now, like they're really, we now know that if kids aren't even read to by the age of two with all the other issues, they're already behind. How do yeah. we do that? I mean, it's horrible, all this shit. You know, those who are in charge would never send their kids to the, something like that. So anyway, uh, the final point I wanted to make is we see them change. Yes. Even in that moment. And for some of the people, so if I reach one person, and whether I'm working with a thousand or whatever, my goal is complete. Fortunately, because I have a great staff and myself and everybody, we touch many people and it's sustainable change. It's not just for that moment. It makes them think like, wow, but when we did the one for recovery, one of the guys said he went, he'd been in jail many times. He'd been in recovery for years. And we painted the trunks of trees in this forest. We did like 52 of these to honor either an individual or a, a home or a group who were in recovery. And when he was interviewed, he said, look what we did here. Oh, my God. If someone in recovery can do this, we can do anything. Wow. And well, so you, we do. you've talked about these communities where um, – they've been stuck in their situations and your work has helped them through. Can you tell our listeners and viewers about a time when you were stuck in your art and some of the tools that you use to break free? Wow, that's a great question. Excellent. So I think the most challenging part of my early career, like I thought I was going to be in the theater. Okay, so this will be a good one. So I grew up in it. My father, when, when I was two, I'm the eldest of four kids. And, um, so can I quickly say something about my siblings? Of course. Go right. off. Because so, all right. I, have, I have amazing siblings and daughters. But I'm going to tell you about my siblings. My one sister, Ellie, who you contacted me through in California, she just left an organization, Point Blue, after 20 years. 
but she was a Gore 1000. She graduated from the Harvard JFK School of Public Policy, and she also started the whole entire anti-nuclear movement in California many, many years ago. And she's one of the world's experts on climate change. That's her, and her wife and kids are all amazing. My youngest sister lives in Manhattan, has this organization, you all should look it up, Cafeteria Culture, how she single-handedly changed the culture where 800,000 trays a day in the New York City school system were being thrown away. And she single-handedly changed it. She had to go to a new inventor, find price points, go to every government agency in each borough. And she's been honored to speak in front of the UN. And now 5 million trays in New York City and some other school districts are now being recycled or composted every day. Uh, and my amazing. brother has been in Paris for 40 some years. He's a Marquise. He plays all over the world for every continent. Um, he's also been sent to do great work in Africa and North Vietnam, North Vietnam, in Vietnam and other places, but all over the world from the wealthiest to the poorest. He mostly accompanies the fa most famous divas in the classical world. Wow. What's his name? Jeff Cohen. Okay. Uh, Debbie Lee Cohen Malloy is in New York, cafeteria culture. Jeff is in Paris with his longtime boyfriend and my sister, Ellie with her wife, Mickey, and they're two fabulous kids. And my sister, Debbie, has two fabulous kids in Manhattan. All my nieces, nephews, cousins are all amazing. They all do stuff. My cousin, Amy Berman Jackson, is the judge in the Manafort trial and was appointed by Obama, one of the few that got through. She's the one that's in the news all over the world these days about with Manafort and all the other cases. What? And she loves musicals. So she uses musicals as part of her summary, right? <laughs> She uses mu like musical references. Yeah, yeah it's great. You know, because we all grew up with musicals. The world's a musical. We actually believe that, okay, viewers. <laughs> Look, I'm with it. I'm with it. So you said you started off wanting to be that, and then what happened? Oh yeah. So I was in a theater company for many, many years. So I, in essence, what I didn't realize was I was by the time I was 14, my parents let me do it because I was doing getting straight A's, okay. But after a while, I found it was a very abusive company. You know, it wasn't sexually abusive. It was highly emotional. It was like a cult. It destroyed many of my friends. So I won't even mention their name. Right. And I didn't know how to extricate myself from that. I didn't share anything with my parents. In essence, I substituted a functional family <laughs> for a dysfunctional, perverted family. Perverted in the sense that I mean is that they were really abusive. And they had the power and they knew they were doing it. I'm sorry. Yeah, so... So it took me a while, how do I get out of it? And then, then also on the other, so the problem with it was that half of it was fabulous. When we were performing, when we were rehearsing, it was glorious. I did 100 productions before I went to college, the musicals, from dinner, adult dinner theater, the reviews, the children's theater, 100 productions. Plus by the time I was 14, they said, well, you got to work on sets. And I said, oh, uh, I'm an actor. And they said, yeah, yeah, you're going to work on the sets. And of course, I didn't know that would change my life also. So you see... It was both good and bad. So those of those who have been through that, it's a little more complex that how do you pull out of that? Right. So I eventually did. And one of the great lessons I learned from that is when I said, all right, when I have people working for me, I can never be like that. I got to really respect. I've worked with uh, hundreds of college interns, male and female, of all persuasions and backgrounds. I've always loved collaboration. One of the things I love with the community-based work is it's kind of like performing, right? And I miss that you know, camaraderie of, you know, us being together. You know, we come from all different backgrounds, but somehow we find the commonality of the arts and that's yeah. mostly evident when it's performing arts. And most artists hate working with anybody, but I love to hear their voices. I'll give it up for that. And when kids say, well, Mr. J, they're doing that. You said you can't do that. I said, yes, but they do it so well. If you, can, if you do it better than what I say, God bless you, kid, do it. Or adult, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was, I remember that was a big crisis. The other big change in my life, because I grew up in the theater, but then I realized at some stage, um, literally I was on stage in some dinner theater production in 11th grade. Uh, God bless my parents who are smiling up there somewhere, I hope. Um, they are. They said, <laughs> thank you. They said, um, you know, I would come home at midnight, 12, 30. I mean, I was like 10th grade, 11th grade. But I could have run gangs. I could have done all this other shit. I had this centered me. I was getting straight A's. It wasn't a challenge, right? Mm -hmm. The theater in an adult theater group with all the bullshit of the cultness, there was still enough of it there with my friends who were there that I closely worked with. As you know, it was fabulous. I mean, 
if I had to do it over again, I'd do it over again, right? You know. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Right. So then I, I remember one day I'm on stage. I'm, I don't know. Maybe it's Hello Dolly, and we're doing some number, right? Like you know, Hello. You know, I used to. Yeah, say yeah, this, yeah. Right. But I realized I'm not. You know, I could. I did so many times. I'm doing the choreography. I'm singing, but I'm not thinking of my character. I'm looking at the lights. I'm looking at the orchestra. I'm looking at the audience. I'm looking at the costumes, the sets. I said, Uh oh. And then I realized that maybe performing wasn't for me. I did audition for Juilliard. It was their second year of their mm-hmm. theater program. I thought I did great. <laughs> they did not. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, my life is over, you know? Right, right. And one thing led to another. I went to Indiana University. I studied with, you know, I took an elective in art that completely changed my life, right? And plus the art history class I took, and who thought of art? I remember wandering around the grounds in the winter, in the winter of 73, of January 73, like so many decades ago, thinking, oh my God, it's over. And then the angels came down and said, Jay, you took, a, in 12th grade, you took a, an art class because you figured maybe I have to learn about sets. And that's when the angels whispered to me and something came out. I said, oh my God, I got talent. So that was a great transformation, you know, but you have to go with it. So then I took art and I worked on it so hard that I, I was like on Broadway in art, Hollywood in art, you know, for 20, half of my, for tw- first 20 years of my art career, from like 19 to 39, I gave everything away. So I'm sorry you didn't know me then because I could have given you all these watercolors. I'd still give you one, Andre. You know? <laughs> so you got to let me know when you perform because I also sketch during performances. Uh, actors, dancers, musicians. Sketch during performances? Yeah, yeah, I'm the guy you don't want to sit next to unless it's like Hamilton where everybody's so, ram, you know, so energetic yeah. anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I have thousands of watercolors. And when I do landscapes, someone drives me. It's easier out west or in other countries. You can't, it's hard to do that in the east. But out west, the, the vistas are so big. So my, right. work, my work, when you see like a giant painting, let's say, a portrait, let's say, of Ravi Shankar or somebody that doesn't have to be famous. They, could be, they just have to be really good. It's a culmination of all their, the whole performance. So a gesture from here, the drapery from there, the lighting from here. And through my watercolors and I, through the cutouts, I reconstruct it. And that became the basis for how I do the murals because that's why they do that whole process. I tried to find something that would parallel technically what I do in my art. The beauty of the community-based public art is the impact of social justice. In 2004, I was given a fellowship from the Open Society Institute in Baltimore. Mm. And that also was one of those changing points because once this was about three years, four years, five years after I did that mural with the kids I told you about. And took, after I did that first one, I really had to sit for a year and think about, wow, man, my conscience was raised. My consciousness was raised. I saw these kids needed something. There's no one to provide it. Arts are one of the first things, as we know, cut out of the schools. You know, this false illusion that's only for kindergarten kids, although right. they're talented, but if we're the most creative country, we pride ourselves on that. We cut all the creative elements out. Like, well, how are the people going to thrive? <laughs> right. We all know that. We know how it changes everything. It doesn't matter who you are, how challenged you are, whatever challenge you have, whether you're missing all your limbs or you're missing all your rights. If you have the arts there and it shows you, opens up doors, you say, wow, I can do that. Those in power that want us to stay there, that's what they're afraid of. Yeah, they don't want they don't want us liberated and singing oh, in the yeah. street. They, they, it's more than our skin, our sexuality, or whatever it is. It's our brain, right? Yeah, and that's what we do in these things. We open up the things, the possibilities, the raising of the consciousness that those in power don't want to be changed because they may or may not be a part of it. Enlightened leaders will embrace it, um, and there are many of those. It's, this guy makes everybody look bad. Um, he whose name cannot be mentioned. <laughs> oh, I don't talk about forty-five. Yeah, right. So it's embarrassing, right? Every time, like, if I have an Uber somewhere, like, and generally it's someone, you know, some brilliant person from another country, right? Mm-hmm. The first thing I said, I, I have to apologize for my country because I right. said, embarrassed. I said, this is not us. And it is not. Well, I've been listening to spiritual teachings recently that deal with the power of fascination. And the things that we fixate and fascinate on the most are the things that we keep calling into our experiences. Right. And so that's why I started Love City Arts, because it's like this gives another focal point for the gathering of lights and healing energy so that we don't have to talk about 45 because you're throwing amazing murals up all of the planet that are are the same. That's why I do this work. Yeah. What are you working working on right now? 
So right now I'm still in the middle of the Callaway Elementary. We just finished three months of science with PhDs talking about, we studied the brain. So now I know when I can't remember anything, it's because of my hippocampus, right? Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. Our, Our hippocampus, I see. Yeah, you. They, and hippocampus is Greek for seahorse because the shape of the seahorse, that's what it looks like. And all okay. my elementary school kids all knew that. So we went to the University of Maryland, Baltimore School of Medicine, brand new labs to do a field trip a couple weeks ago. All the scientists, they were amazed at the knowledge our kids grew, our, our kids knew, but our kids were even more amazed how we were slicing up rat brains, because we're all familiar with rats, right? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, especially in New York. <laughs> yeah, any, any city, Baltimore, it's like the yeah. other population. They're the other other. <laughs> wow. So I'm doing that. I just came back from San Diego, where I have several possible projects there, including University of California, San Diego, Thurgood Marshall College, and... Okay projects with some Jewish institutions, some other uh, Latinx groups out there. Yes, um, Latinx. A new project for, um, with, with, for those in recovery in Baltimore City. That should be a big installation probably in September. So there's always stuff. You know, our fields, you know, half our time is spent trying to get the next job. And oh, yeah. you always got to have a few because even if it's guaranteed, it could fall through, right? So... But I love this, and I've done more and more of that. Um, and I didn't realize when I got the OSI grant, the Open Society Institute grant, there were only like, you know, each year there's only about 12 of us that get it, eight to 12. It gave me a nice size stipend to actually just do that work. And I work with my com uh, companions in West Baltimore, and we start changing. That's when they told me, they said, Jay, you gotta go to elementary school. We've already written off the middle school kids and high school kids. They're always so troubled, but we can make a difference if you go to elementary. And I said, oh, Get them while they're young. Yeah, and I said, oh, I don't work with kids, and they all laugh. But you know what? That also changed my life. So we learn sometimes you got to break down your stubbornness and just jump off the cliff and say, I can fly. And all that changed my life. So the negative things that I had, like with this theater company, were good because it gave me, uh, like they say in science, a null hypothesis where you have two things to compare. Yeah. So whenever I'm in doubt, I don't have to only look at those who survived the Holocaust or the man outside my building who has no legs that lives on a skateboard but still loves life, right? Or someone whose family was lynched, you know, and I think, okay, I've never had any of those nightmares. But I still have a down day, and then I think back, I said, whoa, man, you got to get out there. This is the gift you've been given, and this is what you got to transmit and transmute to others, and it actually works, right? Uh, the where can people, that's so beautiful, Jay, like where can people find out more about you online? They're going to call you. Hey. <laughs> yeah, no, no. <laughs> call me, baby. Call, and me. call my sister. I'm going to give you her number. <laughs> yes. Go, go, go. Well, I I'm have gonna... a website, and thank God my daughter, who's in her first year of college at Chapman University in Southern California, who's also very brilliant. And I'm sorry, Liliana, I love you. So if you watch this, probably not, but you know. Uh, and my ex I'm very close to, she'll watch it. And my mother-in-law, who's still my mother-in-law, though, I'll watch this. They're all great people. Yes. I'll give you my website. But I'm, my daughter had me change it. She says, Daddy, you have so much work, nobody can find anything on there. So I'm going to give you the one I'm work I have now. Okay. But eventually, in a couple months, it'll be put on there that there's a new site that's much easier to see like this. And I'll link that in all my spaces and blast that out to people. Thank you. So it's, it's Wolf schlossberg Cohen Studio. Dot com. Okay. Cool. The new one will be a lot smaller because my daughter did it. She said, you got to drop all that. that. She says, nobody can do all that. I said, yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's, a lot, it's a lot of letters. But you're worth, you're worth it. I always end um, every interview. Uh, thank you for being here, by the way. Oh, like, my God. I'm honored. I hope I will meet you. Forgive it. When you're in the city, we've, we've got to – we'll talk about that after, this, after okay. the interview. All right. But uh, I always yeah, – end... You can listen to this. <laughs> exactly. The, 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 the behind the scenes. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I always end every episode uh, with three fill-in-the-blanks. Uh, All right. And so here they are for you. Um, your three fill-in-the-blanks are love is – The most important – thing we can do to another person and ourselves. Joy is? See, first sentence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. A little, no, no, no. Joy is being able to do the work that I'm able to do. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. 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 
freedom is. For everyone, goddammit. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you, Jay, for being here. Oh my God. Andre, you're amazing. I, like, I, you know, I hope we'll do something together one day. I would love we got to collab, man. We got, we got to collab. We'll talk about that. We should do that. Cool. Thank you. No, thank you. Everybody, thanks for watching. Yes, Don't yes. Up. Don't give up. Love is possible and good endings are possible. We have to always spread that. I'm with you, man. If we focus only on the negative, it's like focusing only on hate. Hate is as much intensity as love. And that doesn't mean we ignore it. We just have to change it. And it yeah. can be changed. I am witness to change. I've seen it literally with yeah. all kinds of people. And it can be done. So let's do it. Thank you. Thank you. All right.